presentation by me on the status, what EPA is doing. It's always good to follow my USDA ARS colleagues. Um, so this morning with a focus on soil fumigants, and thank you again to Chris and the commission for inviting me to um, Linden for participating in this conference. So just like yesterday, the overview is going to be a re-registration recap because there was a significant amount of work that was done um, during re-registration. I want to emphasize that. Okay, so, um, so slightly different from some of the things that we talked about yesterday with the soil fume. Again, we really spent a lot of effort in trying to um, get the data that we needed to do the risk assessment and came up with different mitigation strategy in terms of buffers and tarps, et cetera. So, um, another thing I want to talk about is just the overview of where uh, re-registration review is and then some of our decision approach, schedule, ongoing activities, and then path forward. So as I mentioned just earlier that um, for the fumigant re-registration, um, the decision came out in 2009 for this group of uh, soil fumigants. And we identify risk to applicators and workers and bystanders and then require um, pretty significant amount of mitigation that occurred. So um, I think folks are aware that there were two phases of implementation of the mitigation. A um, couple of things that we learned during registration is that for this group of chemical, the benefit is really high. As I talked about yesterday, um, for anything that's not food related, we can consider benefit and along with the risk that presents itself. So for a lot of the um, soil fumigants, especially in this group, that they were showing high benefit. So we put in some mitigation during re-registration to protect um, applicators, workers, and also bystanders. Um, one thing I wanted to say is that for this particular uh, group of soil fumigants, we, re we really base our decision in re-registration on high quality data and multiple lines of evidence. So at the time, we had both human and animal toxicity studies. We had exposure analysis based on monitoring and modeling. And then we had incident reports that came in. So um, in other words, a lot of good information and data went into this decision back in 2009. So label implementation happened in two phases, as you know. Phase one was done in 2010, and phase two was done in 2011 and then everything was in the field by 2012. So now we enter into the follow-on program of registration, which is registration review, which is what my division does. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, I have about 50 people. Uh, most of them are chemical review managers, and they each have about a dozen cases, and soil fumigants is all in one group of folks in my division. Um, so. As part of the amendment to the FIFRA, uh, Food Quality Protection Act, FQPA, created a registration review process, which requires the EPA to review each pesticide that was registered at least every 15 years. Um, for the first round, it started in two, for all the pesticides that were registered um, 2007 and beyond. So the first round, which is what we're in right now, have to be completed by 2022. So we have about five years to finish up the work that we need to do. Um, for this first round of reg review. And then following that, each chemical, depending on its registered date or its reg review date, will be looked at every 15 years, no, no longer than every 15 years. I love it when people are nodding in the audience. That means that they're, they're getting what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> um, I know a lot of it's process, but... Um, this is how we get ourselves together in terms of organization. So the next slide is just decision approach. Um, again, I talked a little bit about this yesterday and just want to reemphasize kind of the purpose and how is registration review different from re-registration is that we aim to increase transparency by including multiple public comment periods. Um, in fact, for the registration review, there are three. First, we have our work plan that tells everybody what we're planning to do and what data is missing. Um, the public has 60 days to give us feedback on whether or not we have the use and usage information correctly, et cetera. And then we have the risk assessment process where we develop our human health and eco ecological risk assessment. And then that has its own 60-day public comment period. 
And then we work with our stakeholder to come up with the proposed interim decision, which is indicating to the public what we intend to do in terms of mitigation. And then that in itself has at least another 60 day public comment period. So for the registration review, a significant difference between this and re-registration is the transparency that's being built in. And the second purpose of the registration review is really trying to figure out, is there any science and policy change since our um, decision last time? So is there any significant changes? And then what new study and information do we need? And that's when we usually tell the public in the work plan period. And then would our regulatory position change as a result of new information? So we kick off the process for registration review in 2013 um, for the list of soil fumigants that we're talking about here. So for soil fumigants, our decision approach right now is to ensure that there's consistency across all of the chemicals in this group and then evaluate how the labels and mitigations are working since it's been in the field since 2012 and then consider any additional data that may help refine the risk assessment. So I don't know if it's clear what we mean by refining the risk assessment. Generally, um, it depends on the quality and information that we receive. If we don't have some of the data, we have to make assumptions. And one way we do that is to include a safety factor. And you may have heard about that. So um, the more information that we have, the less we have to rely on the safety factor to make decisions in the risk assessment process. So that's what that third bullet is really talking about. So I'm going to go into the group of um, soil fumigants that, uh, that's really in play here. Um, so obviously, if you want more information on the specific fumigant, you can get onto our uh, website, which is regulatory.gov. You can take a look at the dockets that um, we have for each of the soil fumigants. So just in general, um, what's going to happen is that we already finished the, everything that's 2016 and before, um, we have opened our dockets, we have finished our data call-in. So the reason that data submission has a gap of 2016, 2018 is that it depends on when the registrar received the data, they're either generating data or we have received majority of data already from the registrar. So we're starting to um, formulate our risk assessment. So at this point, we are looking at a proposed interim decision in 2019. So you may be wondering that I talk about that we had a good amount of data re with re-registration. So what did EPA ask for then this time? Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about for re-registration, a lot of the focus was on bystander and worker risk. Um, now we're looking at what are the ecological impact of soil fumigants. So as you can see, some of the example of data that we have required, and this does not apply to every um, soil fumigant that I had listed is, for example, honeybee acute vapor exposure, um, different aquatic studies, including fish, um, also birds, and um, different plant toxicity. Now, the last two is related to more human health, ambient air monitoring data, and also carcinogenicity studies. So one difference between uh, what we did with re-registration and reg review for carcinogenicity study would be in addition to the parent compound, we're also looking at some of the, um, the degradates of, of the parent compound. So I really have already talked about this. Um, so the focus for this round is looking at both ecological and if anything we need to do more on the human health risk assessment. And when completed, these assessments will be published for public comments. So again, the main question is incorporating new data as they become available. What has changed in terms of science of policy? And what are some of the new information that we can do to kind of further reduce the safety factor and refine the risk assessment? And then where is possible um, since we only have five years left to do the first round of reg review to streamline the risk assessment as much as possible. So for example, instead of doing one, we may consider combining some of them together and um, to be more efficient. 
So then the path forward, once we have received the comments on the draft risk assessment and determine if a revision is needed, we'll definitely work with a stakeholder to figure out um, if any changes has occurred as a result of new information that co have come in. Again, as I alluded to in the beginning, for this group of chemicals, there's high benefit and we recognize that. And that goal has not changed since we did re-registration. So we will work um, diligently really with the stakeholder if there's any remaining risk that we need to address to figure out what's the best approach to go forward. So just kind of recap some of the stakeholder engagement process. So the public comment period for the draft risk assessment is going to happen in 2018. Um, in fact, the teams from both the human health and the eco risk divisions are working on them as we speak. And we are planning to propose our interim decision in 2019. So this then will culminate into an interim decision in 2019, 2020. And um, then we'll be working with the registrant to have them, if there's any label changes, for them to come in with label changes. So I think one of the um, advantages and the reason I wanted to be here is really to hear from you all about some specific information. As I talked about before, um, we oftentimes do risk assessment based on the information that's on the label, which is not always clear. So one thing that we wanted to make sure is that, um, that we capture the specific information for use on use. Uh, some of the examples, the frequency of use and the size of the treatment area, um, obviously the best way is to submit that through comments to us. When you take a look at our risk assessment, does it make sense on the assumptions that we put in to how much is being used, the frequency, um, area, et cetera. So the second thing is another good um, reason for being here is kind of taking a look at the new technology and method. What is out there that we should be aware of? And then what are some of the specific challenges that folks have with um, the implementation that has already occurred in 2012 in the field with the re-registration. So I think that's really all the information that I have. I, I, we have a lot of information on the website just because of the amount of efforts I alluded to before on the soil fumigants during registration. So we're constantly trying to update to make sure that the toolbox is available and is useful. Um, so we'll obviously solicit feedback as well if you have anything on that. And so I listed a contact for my staff, Dana Freeman. She really is the expert on soil fumigants, and she's sorry that she cannot be here. Um, she had a really a conflict. So I think that's it. Is there any questions? Her stunningly Eugene. clear. <laughs> she is a great presenter, and she's here all the way from DC. So this is a great opportunity to ask any questions, engage with her. Anybody? Questions, yes. Now it's on. Now um, it's on. My question is, is the burden for providing data solely on the registrant? So when you request data back that you need more, that goes to them and they have to figure out how to generate it? Correct. Okay. So our work plan generally talks about what kind of risk assessment we plan to conduct and what kind of data we plan to uh, studies that we plan to issue to the registrant. So that's what that data call in the DCI is. So once that work plan is complete, we basically process that and then issue a data call in to all the registrants that are involved. And then they conduct the studies or sometimes they formulate a task force and figure out who's going to be doing that and who's going to pay for what. Sometimes they do. Yeah. You're, it's not on. I got a strange question. That, you have a great question? Okay. No, strange. Strange. Oh, okay. <laughs> Everything for me is strange. But anyway, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, uh, like y yesterday, uh, you, you, you talked about uh, uh, all the amount of thousands of, of uh, comments that come in. Yeah. But, but I'm realizing as a so-called uh, mixed up media and, 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 and uh, uh, well uninformed uh, uh, normal public that's paranoid of, of, of the pesticides. Uh, 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 so you get a lot of that stuff coming in that, that uh, 
you know, really what the people don't even know what they're talking about. You follow what I'm saying? I do. Uh, okay. And the question is, how do we deal with that? Or yeah. <laughs> we say thank you for your comment. We have taken certain concern to consideration, whatever it is, we'll refer them to the assessment that we have done. So I think um, just to kind of follow on that, I think one of the greatest challenges um, with the program and also I, I think just with ag is people do not always understand what it takes to, um, to create food, I mean, to produce food. And I think there's a severe lack of understanding on that and how the role, I mean, the role of pesticide in making, that, making sure that making it happen. So, so I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. Yes. So um, when, it's on. try and make sure it's on. When you consider the benefit, the, um, what's changed, since the previous review, can you also consider changes in benefits? What I was thinking of is that, you know, a lot of the critical use exemptions for methyl bromide have gone away since the initial evaluation of right. other fumigants. And we rely much more heavily on chloropicrin and on telone than we did before uh, the critical use exemptions were, were, had gone away. So does that additional need for the products go into EPA's consideration? Yes. So um, obviously we work with our air office in terms of critical use exemption for methyl bromide. And I think for 2016, it was the last kind of batch for dry hand or for hand production and also for strawberries. So definitely as things evolve, we want to make sure that we capture the benefit information. So definitely that would be something that um, folks should provide if they feel like the situation has changed. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, too, that we have a division that dedicates, I mean, that's specifically dedicated to benefit analysis, which has um, basically all the um, biologists, um, plant pathologists, and um, entomologists, along with a group of economists, and they're ag economists. And then that group also has use and usage capturing. So we work to purchase proprietary information that um, they survey the growers on exactly what did they use and et cetera. So that's one way that we get a handle by, I mean, for ourselves on how the use has changed since the past five years. Um, the other avenue that we go through is actually USDA, um, Office of Pest Manage Pesticide Management and Policy. Um, oftentimes when we have questions on exactly what's happening with the use, we work with them to work with IPM centers to figure out what is being used in certain regions so that we can capture kind of the regional differences as well. But again, you know, once, once you folks take a look at, I think ultimately when the proposed interim decision come out, if we definitely capture things, we didn't capture things correctly, we need to know that, that if there's a regional need that we did not capture, then we need to, you need to submit information for us to consider. Thank you. Is there anything else? Feel like I'm ignoring the right side of the room, but no. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Yu Ting. Well, you all will be familiar with our next speaker. We've got Lisa DeVetter giving us a quick talk on nitrogen impacts on nematode parasitism. 